Thank you. So I, I will probably disappoint in at least two ways. So the first one is that uh, we're in the session of semantics and my presentation here is, is, has nothing to do with semantics as in, as in words carrying meaning. It is decidedly anti-semantics in, in this regard. Um, the second one is that I started out with a very specific question um, um, when I was working on this uh, many months ago, which timbrel features Granger course color associations to music, but working with it, I, I realized that th this is actually just a step on the way and that the, um, um, the, object the goal of this research is actually slightly different, but I will come back to that. Okay, so the, the paper has um, some, or the extended abstract, I should say, has uh, references and details. Um, my interest in um, um, the relationship between um, color and music started with this article, what is the color of that music performance that Roberto Bresin was presenting at uh, ICMC in 2005. And uh, of course, cross-modal association has been researched since um, 50, 60 years at least. Uh, S.S. Stevens is very much the, uh, considered the father of psychophysics. And uh, of course, psychoacoustics is uh, one important part of it. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and everything that I'll be talking about co sort of comes out of this um, approach to um, cross-modal associations. So the concept of weak synesthesia was launched uh, by uh, Mar uh, Martino and Marx uh, some 20 years ago. And they have uh, a, 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 um, a, a the uh, sorry, a theory or a hypothesis, really a framework, which is called the semantic coding hypothesis, which is based on three premises that there is a um, meaning based mechanisms that appear as um, cognitive, so post sensory. Uh, secondly, they are semantically mediated through this abstract semantic network indeed, and they're context dependent. A lot of research has come out of Charles Spence's lab at uh, Oxford University, and they, uh, th their slogan is that they study the integration of information through the five main senses. So associations can arise at different levels of brain processing. We can go from the neurological level where there are structural correspondences that depend on um, essentially where in the brain um, information is being uh, encoded and, and processed. And if you have two such regions that are um, in, in physical close proxim proximity, and if they are uh, innovated, so they are linked with many connections, then there are structural correspondences. There are perceptual, so learned statistical co-occurrences which are essentially based on uh, um, our, our um, personal histories uh, of learning what it, what it means to be an organism within an environment. So that's ecological perception. At the third level upwards, we have the cognitive and the, the uh, indeed the semantically mediated uh, um, associations. And then we might add or separate out something that has to do with emotion, which is probably very culturally um, conditioned. So all the afferent information going this way, but we have also efferent um, uh, steering from uh, um, higher processing that steers what kind of um, um, priorities the sensory uh, part of the uh, neural processing system should focus on. Okay, so this is a bit of the theory. And uh, one paper here that may, some of you, if you're interested in this field, you may have come across is, is regards the emotion mediation hypothesis, which, is, uh, which was launched by Stephen Palmer and uh, continued by uh, myself and Anders Friberg and then by um, other people as well. So color association mediated by emotion. Um, I, I will take you through uh, five experiments here um, and, and essentially to show you how my focus was first on soundscape and then going uh, towards film music and now I'm working with uh, electroacoustic music. So this is why I tend to <laughs> include uh, these acoustic 
um, measures of the uh, soundscape or indeed of, the, of, of any kind of acoustic signal, uh, such as uh, level equivalent uh, sound pressure level. And then it's of course more complex psychoacoustic models that, uh, that exist, that have been developed uh, since the 1950s or 60s by Zwicker uh, and uh, more, more likely by uh, Densil Cabrera uh, in his MATLAB library, Sci Sound. And um, so we have loudness, sharpness, roughness, and fluctuation strength as the um, um, most relevant uh, models of perception coming from that uh, tradition, if you want. But th this is based on very basic sounds that have gradually come to uh, be extended to more complex uh, time varying um, stimuli. Okay, and then we have music descriptors, features, the near toolbox, which I don't think I need to go into uh, in this work. We have basic or the pretty common uh, uh, descriptors. Now, more importantly, the response descriptors. So that I've been focusing on visual color and size and quickly found out that, um, um, you know, RGB and um, uh, HSL, they are not color spaces. And uh, they are, they, these are the uh, representations of color that have been used in the liter literature, um, mainly. Uh, but I quite strongly argue that they should not be used because for various reasons, one is that it's uh, almost impossible to, uh, to replicate such research. Um, and the other one is that they, it doesn't link to um, um, research in vis vision perception. Okay, so, but in, in the first work here, I used uh, indeed uh, an, an this kind of swatch uh, color picker. So that was uh, in the initial work, which is uh, sort of reported in this way. Okay. The third part here is indeed the film music project. So I'll talk a little bit about the CLAB as the perceptual color space and where its advantages are. Number one is orthogonality. So it is uh, described in three dimension, lightness, uh, a green to red and a blue to yellow um, uh, dimension. They are uh, made so as to be uh, uh, linear and continuous so that a step change on any dimension at any point is perceived as being equally large. And this allows meaningful calculations such as distance between colors as a Euclidean distance, uh, calculating a mean of several colors or, or a median. More about this in, in the literature list. So, so I designed a um, particular interface to, uh, to work with this. So it's consists of two things. One is a joystick throttle and the other one is, uh, is a, a Wacom tablet. And they link, so the throttle angle links to uh, lightness and uh, the Wacom tab tablet pen XY position links to the green, uh, A and B dimensions and the pressure of the um, tablet pen controls the patch size. So the, uh, the person in this, uh, um, in this experimental situation is viewing this on a screen while listening to uh, some sound being reproduced and then is asked to make the association continuously. So it's sampled at a fairly high rate and, uh, this, uh, and with a good uh, resolution. So, um, So what we get is a response curves that look something like this, and we can calculate uh, averages over time and averages across uh, participants. Yeah. When we compare them on the uh, in the columns to the right, we have the uh, these four um, parameters of uh, of uh, vision: one size and three for color, and uh, the correlations with uh, the uh, uh, sonic descriptor sonic descriptors that I uh, mentioned. So I won't go into details here other than to say that this sort of spread out. There are different kinds of uh, um, linkages going on here that are significant here, but more importantly, we want to try to uh, make a predictive modeling out of this. So in, in the 2015 work, 
uh, the main question was really what was the role of uh, of emotion so if we have a model which is um, which has only the audio uh, as a pool of potential predictors versus another model which has that but also in addition has information about the um, um, uh, emotion ratings corresponding to it how do these models uh, compare and uh, we could show that uh, indeed when uh, emotion is included there is a much uh, better um, better performing predictive modeling as illustrated here so i should just say that uh, these models they have the same dimensionality it's just a question of the differences of where they can take their uh, predictors from uh, the fourth experiment uh, was based on the same thing as a film music, but online. And this, uh, I think it's, I, I want to pursue this, but it was uh, not successful for various technical reasons. So I won't say anything more about that. And now finally, uh, experiment five, which is the electroacoustic music, which I'm um, then currently working on. So we have um, nine long stimuli, a long three minutes. And from those, uh, there are also 27 short stimuli of uh, 15 seconds. So this is the pieces which we, we uh, attack as uh, case studies. Uh, they are some, uh, some of the classics in the genre and uh, some of uh, some more, uh, let's say recent, uh, not, not as well known pieces of music. Um, preliminary resu results on the uh, short stimuli here. And, uh, and a comparison with the, the previous study for, for, for what concerns the A dimension. So that is from green to red. And uh, this is uh, uh, where, where we have a lot of um, uh, also evaluative uh, em emotions uh, linked to this. Uh, and, and there's a lot of parallels going on between these two studies, these two um, um, Corpora of music, but with the same kind of color association method going on. But there's also some uh, contradictory re results that we find here. So, so this, uh, not really sure why this happens, but um, I think that might be solved in the stage of the predictive modeling. But more importantly, uh, since we have the long stimuli, we really want to do a time series analysis here. So um, I think I'm going to skip the idea of uh, playing you that Max Patcher that some of you saw dancing by. Um, uh, suffice to say that um, in what you see to the left here, you have those so time series curves for the size, lightness, green to red, blue to yellow uh, dimensions. And on the right side, you, you have a, um, a visualization of this. We can play this in real time and listen to the music to sort of compare and see what's going on here. So in that you have a, uh, the middle circle is the, is the average and around it, uh, crowning it, you have the individual responses from 21, 21 people in this uh, study here. Um, so for time series, oh, now you actually hear something, but I, I will skip that. Um, and of course, the, um, the acoustic um, um, uh, predictors here, they are also time series, right? And, and there's, a, well, there's a large set of them. So what we need to do when we do time series analysis is, is uh, if we want to have a chance of measuring things like uh, correlations and use some parametric um, strong statistics for this, we need to consider uh, the uh, problems that come up because in time series you have the serial dependency in the data. Um, so one, wh where you are at will influence what the next position will be in your response and also in the music. So everything depends on what has been going on before it. So th there are a number of techniques here and uh, I will just give you a very brief overview of the, the kind of um, um, challenges we face when we meet these kind of data. So the first thing is, um, as, as uh, one of the previous speakers was coming up to, I guess you, you have things like trends in the data or drift in, um, in, in data. So this needs to be removed uh, in a process uh, to, to achieve stationarity. 
or weak stationarity, so within uh, statistical limits. And this is done by taking, um, um, uh, uh, doing differencing. So, so you just look at the difference from one timestamp to the next, and this effectively removes trends in the data. So from the left side to the right side, you have something which um, looks, looks more um, like <laughs> white noise, let's say, but it, it's just uh, removing those drifts and, and trends and, and levels, I guess, because everything is centered around zero. Um, I should also say here at this point that um, uh, our measured, measured variables, so the dependent variables, they are, of course, multivariate. They're, they're, we pick up four of them. And uh, there are many issues with uh, uh, the collinearity between um, these dependent um, multivariate uh, time series. So at this current stage, we only work with uh, univariates and focusing on uh, size because it can be separated out from color and also uh, a derived dependent variable, which is called change. So it's uh, simply speaking, um, if anything changes uh, in any one of these, then that is registered. So that is uh, our current attack. So when we have a univariate such as change here, uh, which has been uh, stationarized, then we can extract the autoregressive components and this is done with uh, uh, ARIMA analysis. So we sort of filter out these kind of uh, serial dependencies that I mentioned. And what we achieve is then um, we take out the dependencies that the signal has to itself or to its own history. And then we can see if it has been re receiving influences from some other time series, uh, an exogenous uh, factor. And here is at this point where the Granger causality comes in. But I thought this was the goal point, but no, it, it's not quite. So Granger causality is actually functions at something like a tool of exploratory analysis. Uh, so that we might see which um, uh, which um, uh, predictor series uh, have, have a chance when we construct the final model. This is a bit like looking at a, uh, um, a cross-correlation diagram before you do a linear regression or something like this. Because in the, um, in the final, final stage, or this is not the final, but the stage of um, uh, max modeling, then we, we look at um, which um, predictor, which set of predictors can then um, successfully predict the, the data in the uh, dependent series. So we have something like this. Uh, y is the dependent variable and uh, AR uh, or Y is the uh, autoregressive portion that we have predicted with, through the ARIMA previously. And TRXX is a, is a trans set of transfer functions from the exogenous, the acoustic variables time series. And that can be several of those and then plus some leftover error, which uh, needs to be, um, um, uh, have white, white characteristics. Uh, you know, it means uh, um, uh, equal, equal uh, variance across uh, the range and, and uh, normality of distributions and such. Um, and we evaluate the overall explanatory power of this uh, predictive model from, from the uh, cross correlations um, between its predictions and with the actual data at a range of lags. Now, what we're going to do is of course to expand this to the uh, uh, multivariate dependent variables while maintaining the idea that we can actually identify specific um, uh, acoustic or musical time uh, variables that can actually predict the responses that we're getting. The music experience is a complex phenomenon and different individuals re react differently. Many people find it extremely difficult to describe their experience. It seems to elude common vocabulary. And of course, in this session that we have here on semantics, there are, there are 
absolutely brilliant approaches and i'm so impressed by by the richness of the um, um of the uh data that you're handling and that you're working with uh, but but what i what i want to achieve with this particular work here on color association to uh to uh, sound and music is exactly the opposite namely to have some kind of tools that allow for non-semantic response methods for music perception and cognition research. So this uh, can serve to listen experience with groups of people, of uh, re subjects who do not have the rich linguistic resources. And then we think of young children or stroke pa patients, uh, and indeed uh, non-experts. Um, Secondarily, we have also potential applications in, uh, in uh, graphic user interface design, such as audio software. Uh, and if this can be reverse engineered, then some kind of uh, models for rapid prototyping from uh, a visual color sketching going to sound. So with this, I would like to conclude and happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions? Well, actually, it's it's a very impressive, uh, a very impressive and very interesting uh, work, uh, because at least in uh, in my point of view, uh, despite the fact that I'm not an expert in uh, vision, um, um, there seems to be uh, a very concrete uh, background on uh, mathematical techniques that uh, you employ here. Um, I, I would really have one question. Maybe, maybe I didn't notice uh, when you uh, you uh, gave the presentation. Um, there is inherently um, something regarding color. What actually color is? We are talking about monochromatic color, or we are actually talking about co uh, caloric complexes. And uh, so, uh, how would you imagine uh, a follow up? Uh, your uh, research on uh, more strictly defined um, perceptual and physical targets regarding the uh, uh, visual perception uh, of color. For sure, the uh, the response method, the visual response method, can be developed and can be made a, a lot more uh, <laughs> nuanced and interesting. If, for example, just think about two-dimensional shapes, you know, you can have not just circles, we can have obloids or, or some kind of angles. If you go into three-dimensional objects, that's another thing again. And then you have all, all the business have to do with the surface text, textures. I, I haven't even started to scratch the surface. There, there's uh, some people doing interesting stuff uh, more directly with uh, the appearance of uh, visual, visual uh, surface textures, for example. I, I happen to start with color and uh, <laughs> there's very much to keep me going there. I think Lindsay Raymore has something to ask. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so my question may be a matter of semantics, but, I'm ch but um, I think it's important because sem timbre semantics is a relatively new field and I'm really, I, I work in timbre semantics and I also have work in uh, color and music. And I'm intrigued that you consider your work to be very non or anti-semantic. I think of the color and music, um, maybe it's anti-linguistic in that there's, there's a study of what timbre means and one way of communicating that is linguistics. And another way of communicating it which gets maybe beyond that and maybe, um, you know, maybe gets at something more in some way might be communicating through multimodality. Um, so I, I tend to, I tend to think of it as semantic and I'm just wondering what your response would be to that perspective. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question. I, I think in the, in the context of this work, I'm not looking for meaning. I, I really am not. And, uh, it's almost hard in the experimental situation to to give proper instructions to the subjects and to you know you have to try to tell them to you have to blank your mind i don't want you to think about anything in particular it should be very intuitive and you know b because 
um, it's probably wishful thinking that uh, this kind of um, experiment does not have anything to do with cognition. But I mean, of course it does. There, there is a translation that goes uh, through what the music sort of means and then what do I feel about it? And then, and then making an association with a color because that color means the same things for me. But I actually wish that it was possible to sort of fly under that radar screen. Interesting. Thank you. I appreciate that. Also, your animations are so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can see what I'm playing now. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to compliment and um, I think finalize. Ah, Kai, 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 Kai. Okay. <laughs> you have one more question. Uh, uh, no, and, just uh, one announcement that you don't um, just wanted to raise hands that you don't forget about me, but go ahead, Costas, to close the session. No, 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 no. Go ahead, please. I just want, uh, wanted to make the announcement that I think we need to close now. So um, yeah. the semantic sessions sort of uh, <laughs> run a little bit uh, over schedule, which is fine because now we have this break. Um, and we'll be back at um, 7 p.m. Central European time for the speed dating and then at um, 8 p.m. for the instrument session. And of course, I'd like to thank all the presenters uh, and the chairs of this wonderful session again. Okay. So to uh, recapitulate uh, this extremely interesting session, I would say that indeed we heard uh, about things and got some more enlightening on issues that more or less uh, have engaged most of us uh, at some point. For example, on the possibilities on signal manipulation that needs targets, timbral targets, or the opportunities to move towards more accurate parsimonious and comprehensive uh, linguistic approaches, uh, which can be uh, uh, covering also areas in acoustic ecology and animal acoustics. And finally, integrating approaches of cross-modal perception and cognition, especially um, between two major aspects, namely vision and audition, so thank you all very much for your interest and presence. And to close, Synesthesia has uh, a lot of uh, work to be uh, done uh, uh, towards the study of its relationship between uh, with, with semantics. So thank you all very much. Uh, may, I, may I intervene? Thank you for, for my...